Heavenly Father, we come before you. And Lord, we just uh, look at the days we're living in, and sometimes it's just overwhelming. And uh, Lord, our eyes have to be upon you. Uh, Lord, with our study this morning, that's the focus. And it, it was really the focus last week, too. And you knew ahead of time the things that we would need to encourage us and uh, keep us strong in the days that we're living in, because we are to be witnesses of you, no matter how easy it is and no matter how difficult it is. And Lord, we just pray this morning that you would speak to our hearts and encourage us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, our psalm reading is going to be out of Psalm 141. And this is what we're told. David said this, Lord, I cry out to you. Make haste to me. Give ear to my voice when I cry out to you. Let my prayer be set before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. Do not incline my heart to any evil thing, to practice wicked works with men who work iniquity, and do not let me eat of their delicacies. Let the righteous strike me, it shall be a kindness, and let him reprove me, it shall be as excellent oil. Let my head not refuse it. For still my prayer is against the deeds of the wicked. Their judges are overthrown by the sides of the cliff, and they hear my words, for they are sweet. Our bones are scattered at the mouth of the grave, as one plows and breaks up the earth. But my eyes are upon you, O God, the Lord. In you I take refuge. Do not leave my soul destitute. Keep me from the snares which they have laid for me, and from the traps of the workers of iniquity. Let the wicked fall into their own nets, while I escape to safety." This morning, if you would, please turn in your Bibles to Judges chapter 5 as we continue our study through this fascinating and yet really sad book regarding the nation of Israel and their turning from the Lord. Now, again, we've said this over and over again, but please keep in mind that the, these lessons are here for our learning. And let's face it, if, if the stories in the Bible were about people who did nothing wrong, that were perfect, that their lives were um, had no problems in them, I don't know, it wouldn't be encouraging to me, and I don't think it'd be encouraging to you. Why is that? Because we all have struggles in life. We all fall, fall short at times of what we want to do for the Lord. And many times, we even backslide. Why? Because we take our eyes off the Lord. But here's the wonderful thing, and we see it here in our study in the book of Judges. Our Lord never gives up on us. Never. That's what we see here with the children of Israel, and we see it over and over and over again. You know, think about your own life. Do you really think the Lord's going to say, you know what, that's it, I'm done with you. I can't, I can't take it anymore. No, you know why? Because I know what the Bible says. The work that he's begun in you, he will complete. And I'm so thankful for that. And you need to be thankful for that. But for the children of Israel, it was a pattern. Cyclical pattern over and over again, like I said. They sinned against the Lord. They turned away from the Lord and were following the gods of the pagan, pagan nations around them. And because of their sin, God brought them into bondage at the hand of their, at one of their enemies. There were many in the land. And because they turned from the Lord, this bondage lasted for years many times. In fact, after the death of the judge Ehud, we're told in Judges 4.1 that the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord. They didn't learn. And the result of their sin, of their turning from the Lord, was this. The Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, king of Canaan, who reigned in Hazar. The commander of his army was Sisera, who dwelt in Harosheth, Haggim. So they're in bondage, right? And you would think they'd cry out to the Lord in a week, a month, several months, a year, a few years. But no, they didn't do it right away. In fact, in Judges 4, 3, we're told the children of Israel cried out to the Lord for Jabin had 900 chariots of iron and for 20 years he harshly oppressed the children of Israel. 20 years of harsh oppression before they were broken 
and ready to look upon the Lord. Repent before the Lord. Now again, before we're too harsh on the children of Israel for taking so long to repent, how long does it take us? You see, God is showing us that we're really no different, and many times we allow sin to place us in bondage, and we refuse to repent. We refuse to return to the Lord, sometimes for years, until we hit rock bottom, and then we cry out to the Lord. Here's the thing, why wait? Why endure all that hardship? That's an important lesson for us to learn. The Lord doesn't want us in that condition, but we need to repent. We need to turn to him. And keep in mind, the Lord is never punishing them to hurt them or destroy them, but that they would return to him. And he does the same with every one of us. After the repentance, we see what happens next. God raises up a judge to deliver them. And things are great as long as the judge is alive. As soon as the judge dies, they're back into this cyclical pattern again of sin, servitude, supplication, and then salvation. Now, we are currently in a study here in Judges that is focusing on this song of Deborah and Barak after their victory against Jabin, the king of the Canaanites, and his commander, Sisera. And this is a song of praise unto God for the victory he had given them. And we looked at several points so far in this song that I think are really powerful. We looked at when leaders lead in Judges 5, verses 1 through 2, and verse 9. Remember God in Judges 5, verses 3 through 5. Life under oppression in Judges 5, verses 6 through 8. The stories of God's people in Judges 5, verses 10 through 12. And last time we looked at who will go for me in Judges 5, verses 13 through 18. This morning, we're going to be looking at the battle belongs to the Lord in Judges 5, verses 19 through 23. What I find interesting is the Lord led me back into this point of view. We we dealt with it last week, and it's kind of like, Lord, why are we back here? And the reason being, look at the days we're living in. We need to remember who this battle belongs to. It's not to what well, our ingenuity or our strength. It's the battle belongs to the Lord, and we need to look to him to bring deliverance through the situations we're facing. Now, here's the thing, because we've lost this concept of God today, um, that he's a God of war. We tend to only focus on, he's a God of love. Love, love, love is all you need. But is God a God of war? Is he a, a warrior? Let me share this with you, and you'll see what I mean. And this is going to kind of lead us into our study this morning. This is what we're told. The Lord is a man of war, Exodus 15.3. How do you feel about that description of God? Christians of a former generation felt no embarrassment about it at all. One of the most sung hymns in Sunday school when I was a child began with the words, Onward Christian soldiers marching as to war. It went on to speak of Christ, the royal master, going before us and of the church of God moving like a mighty army. In the days of violent jihads and religious pluralism, we've largely given up using materialistic language for God, a militaristic language of God. Talk of God, our Heavenly Father, is still acceptable among all but the most extreme left-wing fringe of Christianity. And so is Jesus the Good Shepherd. But God as a warrior has almost entirely disappeared from Christian discourse. More is involved here, though, than the Christian jargon. What's at stake is biblical truth. We need everything the Bible has to teach us about God, not just the things we feel comfortable with. Why is it important that God is a man of war? It's important because there are some battles that you and I can't win. We, when we step forward to follow Jesus, we step into a battle zone. The Christian life has to be lived in a world that is hostile to the gospel and is becoming more hostile every day. And behind the people who oppose us are spiritual powers that are far beyond our capacity to deal with. We can't overcome them by just trying hard. The enemy is too strong for us. If we are to have the victory, God must win it for us and give it to us. The good news is that the critical battle has already been won, and the person who won that battle for us has promised to be with us in all the battles we will have to face as followers this side of heaven. That is 
that is how it was for Deborah and Barak. The enemy was too strong. They had no hope against Sisera and his 900 iron chariots unless God went before them and fought for them. But he did. That's, why they, that's what they sing about in Judges chapter 5. And that's really what we're going to be looking at this morning. Like I said, the battle belongs to the Lord. And I've broken these verses down like this. The enemy comes up empty in Judges 5.19. God intercedes, intercedes in Judges 5.20-22. through 22, And the curse of not obeying the Lord in Judges 5.23. So with that as our introduction, let's begin reading. In Judges chapter 5, beginning in verse 19, and let's see what the Lord has for us this morning as we look at this topic, the battle belongs to the Lord. This is what we're told. The kings came and fought. The kings of Canaan fought in Tanakh by the waters of Megiddo. They took no spoils of silver. Now, as you read here about this battle in Tanakh, it would seem that Sisera was reinforced by other Canaanite troops, and these did battle against the tribes of Manasseh. And it would seem that Barak came down from Mount Tabar. He headed westward across the plain to encourage them. And as I read this, I see that the Canaanites were after the spoils of their enemy. In fact, that's why you go to battle. You, you go for the spoil, the land, the, the, the animals, uh, the jewelry, whatever. You're, you're going after the spoils of the victory. And that's what they were doing with the children of Israel. And that's how they went in thinking and they thought it would be an easy victory for them, that they would get much spoil from their endeavor. But it says here, they took no spoils of silver. In other words, the enemy came, comes up empty. Now, here's the thing. Because we don't see a battle today, as Christians, many don't. They want to live in um, an amusement park. They want to live in a theater where they're entertained all the time. But understand, we are in a battle. And I don't think many Christians realize that today. And this is a dangerous place to be. You know what it's called? It's called complacency. A definition of this word is as follows. A feeling of smug or uncritical satisfaction with one's, oneself or one's achievements. In other words, you're satisfied where you're at. You don't feel a need to do anything more. That's a dangerous place to be. See, as we become satisfied where we're at, you don't move forward. You're comfortable where you're at. And in the end, as we become more complacent, I believe, believe we lose hope for the future, and many times even for today. Our hope is in the Lord, and we're created for his good pleasure. But if we lose sight of that, if we think we can find our own satisfaction in life, in the end, we're going to become hopeless. And I know some may be having a hard time with that, but hear me out on this. I think we live in a world where there is a lot of people that are hopeless. This is a report from not that long ago, several months ago, August 29th, 2019. And this is the title of the article, Why Have Young Brits Lost Hope? This is what they wrote. Few things will bring on the goosebumps like listening to Winston Churchill's 1940 Fight Them on the Beaches speech, easily one of the strongest statements of national unity and patriotic defiance in all of human history. The prime minister spoke for a people who, as he said, would never surrender, and he was right. Even with London smoldering from the blitz and the nation standing virtually alone against Hitler's war machine, they didn't break. And their persistence eventually saw the tide turn and Europe liberated. The secret to the, their endurance is really not a secret at all. The British in Churchill's day were a people with a purpose. Churchill called what they faced a fight against tyranny. Tyranny, excuse me, and the nation believed him, as C.S. Lewis observed in his wartime radio address, some of which later became part of his book, Mere Christianity, the Nazis really were wrong, and the Allies were really right. Good and evil exist and can be known. That, Lewis observed, was a signpost to the meaning of life. Britain has undergone quite a transformation since Churchill's speech. Last week, the Sun reported on a new nationwide survey 
survey that plied 1,500 Brits of all ages with a variety of questions about their attitudes and beliefs. Among the results, a stunning 89% of those aged 16 to 29 said their lives lacked meaning and purpose. 89% of the Brits say, in this age group of 16 to 29, said there is no meaning or purpose to life. It's hopelessness. In other words, emptiness is running rampant among millennial and Gen Z Brits. Just half of those aged 60 and over gave similar hopeless answers, which is still not a great result, but certainly better than 89%. The sun suggests this means people find purpose in life as they age. Or it could mean that Brits are steadily losing a sense of meaning and purpose with each generation. Evidence for the later interpretation comes from the answers participants gave to other questions. 84% of the young people said they're failing to live their best life. Nearly 40% also said they'd choose to redo their lives if they could. And what would they change if they could hit that reset button? Over half of Brits believe they were put on the earth to be as happy as possible. Only 37% said their purpose is to make other people happy. And less than a third thought they exist to do as much good as possible. I can't help wondering how different the results would be if this survey had been conducted in the middle of World War II. Would the British have been similarly aimless and preoccupied with personal happiness and fulfillment? Would almost 90% of young people who bore the brunt of the war say their lives lacked meaning? I doubt it. I don't think a British population that hopeless would have had the resolve to withstand the Nazi assault and help lead the Allies to victory. What feels shaky in your world? Are you overwhelmed by the problems you're facing or the pain you're feeling? Maybe you feel hurt by the past, disappointed by the present, worried about the future. So what happened? How did the Brits who outlasted the Blitz transform into people unsure of life's very purpose? My colleague Shane Morris and I wrestled with this question on last week's Breakpoint This Week, and we offered a number of related answers, all rooted in the power of ideas. When Churchill made those thundering moral pronouncements on behalf of his nation, he didn't conduct a poll to find out who thought the Nazis were wrong or worth fighting. He didn't ask each citizen to divine their best life. And he certainly didn't elevate individual happiness to the top of his wartime priorities. But in a world where meaning is up to us, where life supposedly means whatever we say it does, it ultimately comes to mean nothing. A culture that abandons any fixed reference point and instead tells its young people that truth, purpose, meaning, and morality are purely subjective will only, in the end, rob them of any truth, purpose, meaning, or morality worth fighting for. Churchill rallied his nation to a righteous cause. That sort of call requires vertical thinking, a people who embrace a transcendent sense of meaning, And what the world saw were the storms of people like that could weather. Today, Britain and so much of the Western world is discovering that a people without a transcendent sense of meaning can't even weather peacetime. How can you fight for anything when you have no hope, you have no purpose in life? You can't. And that's the problem. Solomon put it like this after he spent a lifetime trying to find all the pleasures in life. And you know what he found out? It's empty. It was emptiness. It was meaningless. In fact, he says in Ecclesiastes 12, 8, vanity of vanities, says the preacher, all is vanity. All is empty. Now, if that's where it ended, it would be tragic, but it didn't. You see, in the end, what he found to bring true joy, true happiness, true hope in his life was the Lord. In Ecclesiastes 12, verses 13 and 14, he says, Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. Why have people, not only in Britain, lost hope? Why have people all over the world lost hope? Because they're not doing what they were created for, to bring glory and honor to God. Until people come back, to the Lord, they're never going to find meaning to life, and apart from God, there's no hope. For Christians, we're focusing on being happy. And no wonder so many Christians have lost hope. Solomon tried it, it didn't work. 
Why do we think we'll find happiness apart from God? We can't and we won't. It's tragic in the church today that I see so much of this psychology coming into it. I just saw a video from a church in town that is now adopting something, that is adopting a psychology approach. Everyone in the world has a mental disorder from this coronavirus and you need help. We are depending upon the philosophies of this world instead of our wonderful counselor. I don't know why these people listen to this woman. She doesn't bring Jesus into it, that's for sure. You have to go back to your past. Remember your past. I don't need to remember it. I need to press on. Forgetting those things that are behind, I press on to the upward calling in Christ Jesus. Do you see my focus? And I'll tell you what, it brings me all kinds of joy and hope because my hope is in him. Well, Pastor Joe, how could you have so much hope? How could you have so much joy when you see all the tragedy that's going on? I grieve over tragedy that goes on. Please, don't misunderstand me. It breaks my heart. I see all these people within the medical community that are trying to help those with the coronavirus. Some of them have been infected. Some of these medical workers have died. I see all these other people in the grocery stores and you know all these other businesses that are still trying to function to help us keep going. And it breaks my heart to see sometimes how overwhelmed they are. But my hope is not in this world. It's in the Lord. And here's the thing. How easy is it going to be for the Antichrist to unite the people of this world together into one world government? Very easy. Look at how they're manipulating people today. And don't get me wrong, I think what we're doing in the state is correct. I think we should isolate ourselves. This is a pretty deadly disease. And if, please, we don't want to be like New York or um, some of these other places that are being devastated. I mean, in one day we had, uh, I think it was 1,200 deaths in one day. That may not seem like a lot, but if that's your family member, that's a lot. We need to keep our eyes on Jesus because he's already told us that these things are going to happen. We're going to have, you know, wars and rumors of wars, earthquakes in various places. There's going to be volcanoes. There's going to be pestilence. There's all, going to be all kinds of things. And what we're seeing right now are the pre-labor pains or the Braxton Hicks contractions. The labor hasn't started. The labor doesn't start till the tribulation period. But we're getting a glimpse of what it's going to be like. And it's not going to be good. And I think the Lord is trying to stir people up, stir Christians up. Hey, it's not time to be asleep. It's time to wake out of your sleep. It's time to keep your eyes on Jesus. And for those that don't know Jesus, it's a wake-up call to them. What in the world is going on? Well, let me tell you. Let me show you. And let me show you a God who loves you so much. I think... Many Christians have lost this hope because they've taken their eyes off of the Lord. They don't want to go into the battles. They don't want to go into the highways and byways and compel people to come into the kingdom of God. And by not going forward, we're letting the enemy take back the spoils of victory. Now, we don't want to talk about sin in the church, so how do people, what are they saved from? We've negated so much of Christian doctrine because we want to reach the goats, but we're not feeding the sheep. And by not giving the goats or the unsaved the truths of God found in the word of God, we're not bringing them to God. That's why they need all the psychological help. And look at what's happened in our country. The divorce rate. Look at the family unit. We don't even know what a family is anymore. Look how sin is embraced and flaunted. 
Look at how immorality is growing. Look how the suicide rate continues to grow because people don't have hope. And I can go on and on, but I think you get the idea. The church has stopped fighting because they are more interested in being happy. No, God says, I don't want you to necessarily be happy. You need to be holy. And it will bring great joy to your life. But you need to stand up for the things of God found in the word of God. Are we to blame? I believe so. We'd love to blame everyone else for this. But where is the church? Where is the light? Remember in 2 Chronicles 7.14, and I realize some say, well, this is just for Israel. But I don't know, this same God who's working through Israel, isn't he working through us? And don't you think he'll take care of us as he did Israel? I think so. This is what it says. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. He's not talking about the liberals, the Democratic Party, this group, that group. He's talking about my people humbling themselves, praying, seeking the Lord, turning from our wicked ways. God will hear from heaven, forgive our sins and heal our land. If we don't, then we get what we sow. We're not going to see the victory that God has for us. Now, here in Judges, we see the children of Israel walk by faith. They defeat the enemy. But it wasn't because they were so strong. It wasn't because they were so powerful. It wasn't because they came up with a strategy or a program. This victory was given to them by God, and we need to remember that. It's not our plans. It's not our programs. It's the Lord who will fight for us, and all we have to do is walk by faith. I mean, think about it. How many of us really thought that we wouldn't be gathering together as a body of believers in a church building? We had all other plans, ideas. It's in the Lord's hands. We need to keep our eyes on him. And really, this brings us to that next point, where God intercedes. And that's the key. Look at verse 20 in Judges chapter 5. They fought from the heavens. The stars from their course fought against Sisera. The torrent of Kishon swept them away. The ancient torrent, the torrent of Kishon, O my soul, march on in strength. Then the horse's hoofs pounded, the galloping, galloping of his steeds. I believe that these verses speak of this storm coming down and the rain pouring down because it talks about the torrent of Kishon. Kishon was not a raging river. It was a tiny stream. It was insignificant until God caused the heavens to open up and the rain to fall down upon the land. And as this occurred, the chariots were becoming stranded in the mud. One writer put it like this, the great victory was due to God's supernatural intervention for Israel. He increased the effectiveness of the Israelite soldiers. The kings in verse 19 are probably all Canaanite kings, as the NIV translation suggests. Tanakh stood near Megiddo, which may have been in ruins at this time. The stars symbolized the forces of heaven that were more specifically the rains God sent. This personification ridiculed the Canaanites' belief in astrology. The flood that resulted from the rain made it impossible for the Canaanites to use their horses and chariots effectively. In all probability, we have to think of a terrible storm with thunder and lightning and hail or the sudden bursting of a cloud, which is poetically described as though the stars of heaven had left their courses to fight for the Lord and his kingdom upon earth. Since Baal was the storm god, Deborah was glorifying Yahweh over Baal in what she said here. Absolutely. Now, Josephus put it like this. He said, so the battle began, and when they were were come to a close fight, there came down from heaven a great storm with a vast quantity of rain and hail, and the wind blew the rain in the face of the Canaanites, and so darkened their eyes that their arrows and slings were of no advantage to them, nor would the coldness of the air permit the soldiers to make use of their swords. While the storm did not so much incommode the Israelites because it it came in their backs, they also took such courage upon the apprehension that God was assisting them, that they fell upon the very midst of their enemies and and slew a great number of them, So that some of them fell by the Israelites, some fell by their own horses, which were put into disorder, and not a few were killed by their own chariots. 
Now, again, some will read this and they think, well, you know, it's just a freak rainstorm that came upon the enemy at just the right time. A stroke of good luck, you might say. Are you kidding me? What are the odds, what are the chances that this rainstorm would come as just, at just the right time and incapacitate Sisera and his army so the children of Israel would not be defeated? The odds aren't good. This was not a random chance happening. It was an act of God, or God intercedes. And as soon as, you know, God told Deborah and Bar- Barak, okay, now it's time to go, here come the rains. No accident. Hand of God upon the ch- children of Israel to give them this victory. Just that God had already promised them. Now let's make this applicable for today. When you look at the things that are happening in this world, when you look at the things that are happening in your own life, when you look at the things that are going on, do you ever think, God, what's going on? Have you lost control? I'll let you in on a little secret. God has not lost control. He's never lost control. I think we understand the reality of that until everything is falling apart around us, and then we wonder, God, where are you? Why is this happening to me? God, are you there? And when we find ourselves in situations like that, where we're wondering what in the world is going on, we need to stop striving and learn to trust in him. Why? How can we do that? It's the title of our message this morning, The Battle Belongs to the Lord. You see, winning these battles that we're facing is not dependent upon us coming up with a plan, like I said. It's not because we're so strong or so smart. It's the Lord who will see us through and guide us as he does. You know, Psalm 20, verse 7, some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord God. Also, Proverbs 21, 31, the horse is prepared for the day of battle, but deliverance is of the Lord. That's a perspective we need to have to trust in the Lord, to remember that he's in control because our deliverance is not going to come from anyone or anything except the Lord. We talked about King Jehoshaphat last week, the king of the southern kingdom of Judah, godly king. And during his reign, there was a military alliance between Moab and Ammon and others. They're gathering together to destroy the southern kingdom of Judah. Far outnumbered Judah. There's no way they're going to win this battle. It was hopeless. What did Jehoshaphat do? Did he get on his camel and ride out of town? No. He called the nation to pray, to seek direction from the Lord. And that's what we should be doing in the days we're living in. Calling out to God, praying, seeking direction from him for our own lives. And what we read in 2 Chronicles last week, 20 verse 12, he prayed, Oh Our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power against this great multitude that is coming against us, nor do we know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. Joshphat knew he couldn't do it. Okay, Lord, this is in your hands. I'm trusting in you. We have no strength. We have no power. There is no way we're going to win this, but Lord, it's in your hands. We trust you. They looked for God for direction. God gave it to them. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel for direction. He said, listen, all you of Judah and you inhabitants of Jerusalem and you, King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord to you, do not be afraid nor dismayed because of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours but God's. Tomorrow go down against them. They will surely come up by the ascent of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Jeril. You will not need to fight in this battle. Position yourselves, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord who is with you. O Judah and Jerusalem, do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord is with you. It was a walk of faith. And they went out. And how do I know that they walked by faith? You know how? Because at the head of the military, they put the worship team. They put the worship people to lead the way. If they weren't trusting in the Lord, they're going to put their best guys up front, right? Not the worship team. But they put the worship team up front. They're worshiping the Lord as they go into this battle, and it sends the enemy into confusion because the enemy just can't understand how you could worship God 
when everything is falling apart around you. And God gave him a great victory. Again, the battle belongs to the Lord. We talked about before the children of Israel leaving Egypt, heading towards the Red Sea. Pharaoh let them go after the death of the firstborn. They got to the Red Sea, a huge body of water in front of them, mountains on either side, and they take a look back. Remember, there's two to three million people or more. They look back and they see the Egyptian army coming after them, Pharaoh leading the way. Hopeless situation, right? What are they going to do? There's no way these slaves can mount an attack against the Egyptian army and win. It was hopeless. And we see in Exodus 14, verses 11 and 12, that the children of Israel, they said to Moses, because there were no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you so dealt with us to bring us out of Egypt? Is this not the word that we told you in Egypt, saying, let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. Were they better off in Egypt? No. They were in bondage, and it was getting worse and worse and worse for them. And they cried out to God to deliver them. Then what is the problem? They forgot about God. Yeah, the Red Sea is in front of them. Yes, their Egyptian army was coming fast upon them. Yes, there were mountains on either side of them, so there's no place to turn. They were trapped. But not really. They just forgot about God being with them. In Exodus 14, verses 13 and 14, Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. The Lord will fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. In other words, Moses wants them to focus back on God. The one who delivered them from Egypt is going to be the one who will deliver them from the Egyptian army and get them through the Red Sea. It's the salvation of the Lord. He's going to accomplish it. The Lord will fight for you. And what did the children of Israel do? Did they just sit around and wait for God to deliver them? No. In verses 15 through 18 of Judges, or Exodus 14, it says, And the Lord said to Moses, Why do you cry to me? Tell the children of Israel to go forward. But lift up your rod and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. And I indeed will harden the hearts of the Egyptians. And they shall follow them. So I will gain honor over Pharaoh and over all his army, his chariots and his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord, when I have gained honor for myself over Pharaoh, his chariots and his horsemen. In other words, the Lord said, hey guys, you got to get moving here. Now, wait a minute. The Red Sea was in front of them. How are you going to get two to three million people? Are they going to swim across? How are they going to get their animals, their children, their belongings? What were they going to do? The Lord's saying, you've got to walk by faith. You've got to trust me. And Moses, as he stretches out his arms, the waters of the Red Sea part, big heap on either side, the children of Israel now can walk through on dry ground. In Exodus 14, verses 19 through 31, this is what we're told, as God brought salvation to them. And the angel of God, who went before the camp of Israel, moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud went from before them and stood behind them. So it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. Thus it was a cloud and darkness to the one, and it gave light by night to the other, so that the one did not come near the other all that night. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night, made the sea into dry land, and the waters were divided. So the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea on the dry ground, and the waters were a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. And the Egyptians pursued and went after them into the midst of the sea, all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. Now it came to pass in the morning watch, that the Lord looked down upon the army of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and cloud, and he troubled the army of the Egyptians. He took off their chariot wheels so that he drove them with difficulty. I love that. Uh, to me, that's kind of funny. And the Egyptians said, Let us flee from the face of Israel, for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea, that the waters may come back upon the Egyptians on their chariots and on their horsemen. 
And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and when the morning appeared, the sea returned to its full depth, while the Egyptians were fleeing into it. So the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. Then the waters returned and covered the chariots, the horsemen, and all the army of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them. Not so much as one of them remained, for the children of Israel had walked on dry land in the midst of the sea, and the waters were a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. So the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Thus Israel saw the great work which the Lord had done in Egypt, so the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. The battle belongs to the Lord. That's the idea here. I mean, talk about an amazing, it was hopeless for them. And yet God brought them through slowed the Egyptians down so all the children of Israel could get through. And once they did, and the Egyptian army was in the middle of the Red Sea, those waters came down upon them and killed them all. One more to show you that the battle belongs to the Lord. Remember after the children of Israel crossed over the Jordan River into the Promised Land, the land of Canaan, that there were enemies that had to be defeated. And the first enemy was Jericho, not a little hick town. This was a fortified city, a walled city. And they already heard that the children of Israel were coming, and they went into lockdown to protect themselves. And the Lord says to Joshua, I've got a plan for you. This is your battle plan against Jericho. Every day for six days, march around the city of Jericho once, keeping silent the whole way. Don't say a word. On the seventh day, march around the city of Jericho seven times. The priests were to blow the trumpets and the people were to shout and the walls were to come tumbling down. You think that was a walk of faith? Absolutely. Can you imagine getting battle plans like that? And yet, by faith, they did it for one day, two days, three days, four days, five days, six days. And on the seventh day, they walked around seven times, shouted, The walls of Jericho came tumbling down. The enemy was defeated, just as God said. So we can clearly see the battle belongs to the Lord. Don't lose sight of that. It's, you know, not only the battles that belong to the Lord, but our weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're spiritual. And that means if we want to be victorious in these battles, we have to listen to the Lord, obey his instructions to us. It's a matter of trust. Do we trust the Lord enough to just listen to him and obey him as well? Sometimes the Lord has us do things that seems, that just doesn't seem right. But it's what God wants because he gets the victory. You know, again, today as we look at what's going on in our nation and the world, we tend to approach it the wrong way. Yeah, we see the rise of immorality and wickedness and a host of many other things that are not of God, and we try to stop them by passing laws, by protesting, by electing this person or that person, by doing this and doing that. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with doing some of that for the most part, but here's the thing. You can pass all the laws you want. It doesn't mean people are going to obey them. This is a hard issue. We tend to leave prayer out of these things, frankly, because well, these things are just too big and we have to rise above and get the money in and get the people in and do this and do that. But it's we, not God. A.W. Tozer, I like what he said. He says, sometimes when we get overwhelmed, we forget how big God is. Did you get that? Sometimes when we get overwhelmed, we forget how big God is. I think that's absolutely true. Do we think that the issues we face in this life are too big for God to handle? No. Do we think that God just doesn't care anymore? No, he does care. He loves us more than we'll ever know. The battle belongs to the Lord. Now, think about David facing Goliath, right? The rest of the children of Israel were fearful of this Philistine giant. This warrior, why? Well, I mean, he stood some nine feet, six inches tall, probably weighing some 500 pounds. Can you imagine? He was a big dude. His armor weighed between 150 and 200 pounds. His spirit weighed 20 to 25 pounds. And here's David, just this little guy. And David knew the battle belonged to the Lord. 
And he wasn't going to go up against this giant on his own. But God was with him, and there was no way he was going to lose this battle. You see, for the children of Israel, they saw themselves going up against this giant. David said, I'm not fighting this guy alone. I'm bringing my heavenly father. I'm bringing God with me. There's no way I'm going to lose this battle. In 1 Samuel 17, verses 45 through 47, listen to what we're told. Then David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword, with a spear, and with a javelin. Isn't that interesting? All military weapons, physical weapons, right? How does David come to this giant? How is he coming to fight? He says, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. Did you see that? The battle is the Lord's. It wasn't David's. He just needed to walk by faith. Paul, listen to what he said about our warfare in 2 Corinthians 10, verses 3 through 6. He said, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God. For pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ, and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Make no mistake about it. We do walk in the flesh. We have physical bodies. That's what Paul's talking about. Paul was flesh and blood just like we are. But he struggles with the same things the Corinthian Christians struggle with and with what we struggle with. But he wants them to understand we don't war according to the flesh. Paul understood that. What are these weapons, these spiritual weapons that he was going to use? Well, the two offensive weapons are the Word of God, which is the sword of the Spirit, and prayer. Those are our offensive weapons. Our defensive weapons are the belt of truth, which holds us up and keeps us from tripping over ourselves. The breastplate of righteousness, that protects our hearts. Our feet are firmly planted upon the gospel of peace. Our shield of faith can quench the fiery darts of the wicked one or from Satan. The helmet of salvation will protect our mind from the evil one. We need to understand that these battles, again, are spiritual. Yes, they're played out in the physical but these, they're behind the scenes. There's a spiritual warfare going on. And Satan and his forces uses people to carry out his work. Remember the battle that you're in. Again, Paul says these things are for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Paul is saying that we're fighting against ideologies or beliefs that people have that are not of God. And every high thing, every proud, arrogant, lofty ideology that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. That includes all the false religions of the world, the cults, atheism, communism, Marxism, secular humanism, naturalism, whatever you want to put in there. They all try to exalt itself above God or the, in the place of God, the God of the Bible. And please understand that this spiritual warfare that we're fighting is really this brainwashing of the devil who's pumped into the minds of the people his false doctrines that will keep them away from saving faith that's found in Christ. Satan isn't against religion. He loves religion because he could use it to keep people from Jesus, the Jesus of the Bible. Now, some laugh at this. And they think it's foolish. Well, it's not. And maybe that's why the church today is so ineffective. Because we're not using the spiritual weapons that God has given to us. What words can we say that can defeat the enemy? There's really none. What are we going to say to him? How are we going to fight this enemy? The word of God really defeats them. Prayer defeats them. Put on your spiritual armor. They're not going to get at you. Does it work? Yes. Clark tells us... 
In like manner, the doctrine of the Reformation, mighty through God, pulled down, demolished, and brought into captivity the whole papal system, and instead of obedience to the Pope, the pretended vicar of God upon the earth, obedience to Christ as the sole almighty head of the church was established, particularly in Great Britain where it continues to prevail. Hallelujah, the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Tragically now, Europe has turned away from God and we're seeing the results and it's not pretty and it's happening here in America as well because we didn't learn the lesson. We didn't listen to what God has warned us. We didn't see the things that happened to the children of Israel when they turned from the Lord. So bring in our thoughts to the obedience of Christ and pull down those strongholds of the enemy that is going after our families and neighborhoods and workplaces and cities and so on. I don't know if some of you remember this years ago. There was a Christian uh, music group called Petra, and they had a song, The Battle Belongs to the Lord, interestingly enough. And it's really perfect for what we're talking about today. It goes like this, In heavenly armor will enter the land. The battle belongs to the Lord. No weapon that's fashioned against us shall stand. The battle belongs to the Lord. We sing glory and honor, power and strength to the Lord. The power of darkness comes in like a flood. The battle belongs to the Lord. He raised up a standard, the power of his blood. The battle belongs to the Lord. When your enemy presses in hard, do not fear. The battle belongs to the Lord. Take courage, my friend. Your redemption is near. The battle belongs to the Lord. That's exactly what we're talking about, guys, this morning. Yes, the battle belongs to the Lord. He's called us then to move out, to get up, to get moving, and see the salvation he'll bring to the situations we're facing. And I can spend a long time this morning showing you how the Lord delivered me from all kinds of situations I have been in that weren't easy. Situations that almost seemed hopeless many times. But as I look back, I see what God was doing and the victory he gave me. And all he wanted me to do was to obey him, to walk by faith, to do those things he's called me to do, to trust in him. And that's what he's calling you to do. The things he's laid upon your heart, to take a step forward and walk by faith. And I truly believe if you look back at your, over your Christian life, your Christian walk, you'd be able to do the same thing as well. See those victories that God has given you, and they will encourage you. God's proven himself in our lives. And we need to remember that, not lose sight of that. You know, I think the challenges we face show us two things. They show us Something about God, the battle belongs to him. We can trust in him, right? And something about us, are we willing to walk? Where is our faith? Is God stretching us? Are we afraid to take those steps? See, we can do nothing apart from him. And if he's always with us, he'll never leave us or forsake us. Why are we fearing? That's really the key. Who are we going to trust? Who are we going to believe in? Look at God's faithfulness to us and trust in him and what he's promised to us. He's more than able to bring it to pass. See, when God intercedes, he does so in an amazing way and brings about great victories in our lives, just as we see here with the children of Israel. They should not have been victorious in this battle. Not at all. They were outnumbered. They were outgunned with these 900 chariots. God gave them the victory. Let's look at verse 23 in Judges chapter 5. Curse morose. And the angel of the Lord said the angel of the Lord, curse its inhabitants bitterly, because they did not come to help to the help of the Lord, to the help of the Lord against the mighty. We see here the curse of not obeying the Lord. Specifically here we see God curse Miraz, which was a town in Naphtali. Why? Because they did nothing. They didn't assist their brethren. You see, sin is not only in our actions, but also in what we don't do uh, when we should. God asked them to help. They refused. You see, we as Christians, by not coming to battle, we're forsaking the work of the Lord. Now, I'm not saying we're going to be cursed, but we're not going to see the blessings that God has for us, and there's many blessings in serving the Lord. And I guess the question may be, why didn't they come to help? Was it fear? Fear of the enemy? Maybe. Maybe they didn't have enough time to get involved. Maybe... I don't know, Jupiter was in a line with Mars, whatever excuse, but it was an excuse. And God held them accountable. Why? Because God had called them. 
and they didn't go forward. What about us? What is keeping us from fighting for the faith that's been entrusted to us? What is keeping us from sharing our faith? What is keeping us from taking down the strongholds of the enemy? It's interesting. You know, Facebook uh, is a very interesting place, especially today. Um, I'm dealing with some people that say that uh, we're basically uh, disobeying the Lord by following Romans 13 um, and not gathering together as a church, a body of believers in a building. We are forsaking the Lord. We are doing wrong. We're not honoring the Lord. We're obeying man rather than God. Romans 13, they say, does not apply to us today. And I, I struggle with that, okay, because I have to say something. And I said, do you really think we're worse than Rome was? And he wrote some stuff down. And I said, look, this is here to protect people. And I'll tell you personally that I care for the people that God has entrusted to me. And I don't want them infected with this virus. Will it happen if we gather together? It may. It may not. But I know what the law now says, what the governor has said. And I'm not going to disobey it because I'm following what Paul had written in Romans 13. Again, he didn't agree with me on this, which is fine. And here's the thing. Who are you going to obey? He said, this was his last point that I had to re respond to. So now the government's telling us that we can't gather together and, and do a Bible study. I said, no, that's not what he said. In fact, we're doing Bible studies all the time. We, we do them twice a week now. We live stream them. We've got them on the radio. The governor did not say we cannot have a Bible study. He said we cannot gather right now. So that's wrong. And I'm going to obey what Paul had said in Romans 13. You see, we have to be wise in these days. we got to listen to what the Lord is saying and not be driven by, I don't know, all these bizarre things on Facebook or in the news, or whatever. What is the Lord telling us? I truly believe God is more than able to see us through anything. And I think many times for us, we look at situations and we make a mountain out of a molehill. Let me ask you this. In God's eyes, is a mountain any harder to deal with than a molehill? No. So if you want to make a mountain into a molehill, go ahead. But it's still not any harder for God. The problem is if you're struggling with the mountain, it's because you've taken your, your eyes off of God. Is anything too difficult for God? No. There is nothing too difficult for him. I think we need to remember that. You know, I realize, you know, people are worried, what am I going to do? How is this going to work out? I don't always know. But I know God does. In fact, God knows the beginning from the end. I shared this with you before, but, you know, we look at things straight on. Imagine, you know, the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. And there you are. You're on the street. You're watching it. What can you see? Well, you, know, you see just the things that are in front of you. That's all you could see of the parade. You can't see the, you could see the beginning, but once it passes by, now you see this part and this part, but you can't see the end yet. Imagine if you're up on the top of a skyscraper and you're looking down at the parade. And you're looking down at the parade and you could see the beginning of the parade the middle of the parade, you could see even the end of the parade. You see the whole parade. Why? Because you're above it. That's God. He sees the whole picture. And I may not understand it, but can I trust in him as he calls me to walk by faith? 
you know, how often we're grounded in our walk with the Lord because we can't see straight. We're all in a fog, you might say. And you know how fogs are. It's foggy outside, I can't see. You know, God can. You know, Solomon puts us back into the place where we need to be, especially in difficult times. He said in Proverbs 3, verses 5 through 7, Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. I like that. Trust in the Lord. Can you lay your whole life into his hands and not trust your own understanding of situations? Acknowledging him and letting him direct your paths. Again, I've seen that over the years where, you know, God has told me to do something, and I was nervous about doing it. I knew what the Lord said, but I was still nervous about it. And as I did it, I was blown away at how God used that, the things he showed me through what I did. If I leaned on my own understanding, I would have never done it. But I trusted in him with my whole heart. And he directed my paths. I don't want to be wise in my own eyes, because I'm not. My responsibility is to fear the Lord and depart from evil. Keep my eyes upon him. Not to try and figure things out on my own, but walk by faith and let him direct me. Let him direct you. If any of you are hurting today and you need to talk or you want to email me, please do. I realize these are really troubling times for a lot of people. Being isolated from others is very stressful. I'll be more than happy to talk with you. I'll be more than happy to email with you. Don't be out there on your own. And I would encourage you, read the Word of God. Read in the Psalms. I mean, the Psalms are just a wonderful book of of just focusing back on God. Many of the Psalms that David wrote, he was... He starts out being downcast. Oh, why are you so downcast, oh, my soul? He's distraught. He's hopeless. Then he goes, oh, hope in God, and he's all better. You see, he got refocused. And that's really what we need to do. And as we read God's word, his spirit will open it up to our hearts and our lives and encourage us in the things we face in this life. My prayer is that you have been encouraged this morning. And that you have seen that the battle belongs to the Lord. And all he wants you to do is to walk by faith. Let's pray. Father, again, we thank you. And I, Lord, needed to hear this again. Just to be encouraged and to stay refocused upon you. Lord, there's battles every day out there. This world's going to get darker and darker. But Lord, you said we are the light of the world now. And we need to shine for you, to point people to you, Lord. Help us to do that. We pray that each and every one of us would be empowered by your spirit to bring the gospel message forward to a lost and dying world. Help us, Lord, to live. Help us to walk by faith. And Lord, if there is any struggling here this morning, Lord, touch their hearts. Lord, if there's anyone who's even who's thinking about suicide, Lord, touch them. Help them to see you love them more than they'll ever know. Stop them from going down that path because the devil wants to kill and destroy lives. You want to give life and you want to give it a life abundantly, and we're so thankful for that. Lord, reach out to the people. Heal them. You are the wonderful counselor, and we need that. And Lord, then help us to walk accordingly. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.